and welcome. Lecture one, a quick look at OLS with Stefan Eriksson and today, yeah, you got it already. Let's just get rolling. For today's lecture, as already signaled a bit, we're going to talk about OLS and stuff, or in other words, just a quick look at OLS. I have uh, listed up these uh, five main areas here, and first that's just a quick look of the estimator. How do we estimate these unknown parameters? What are the properties that you get? And, uh, well, there's always assumptions behind properties. Otherwise, yeah, we'll get there, of course. And, of course, it is the best estimator we can use if all the assumptions are satisfied. So, uh, cheers, everyone out there. Make sure everything is running and uh, it seems to be going okay. I hope so. Let's uh, get into the main stuff here today. I can already tell you, I don't plan on using the full time today. So today is an easy start for everyone. But I swear, when we get around to say lecture four, I'm going to be using the full time and maybe a little more. So I will cash in on the time I give you extra today. Sorry I couldn't, uh, well, level that out a little better. But um, it's because I don't want to divide certain material over multiple times. Better you get that chunk in one go. But for today... Ah, shouldn't take the whole time, so you should be fine. Now, let's go in here, and uh, there's a few more things, of course. There's some supplementary material I will not discuss here today, because that is, of course, assumed known. It goes a bit under the prerequisites of the course, but yet I made a short video to just explain it. That goes about the hypothesis testing and R-squared and more. So you, that is example material. I'll repeat it one more time, just to be absolutely crystal clear with you guys. The supplementary material is example material and yes i can yeah guarantee you there will be questions on the exam about that as well so um yeah you get better get around to it just so i can tell you now i told you so hope that's clear mm -mm -mm. ah the coffee good 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 so what is a regression model guys and hopefully you know but um for those who don't know it's uh, the most important tool in econometrics. It's basically the backbone of the whole econometric analysis toolbox. And uh, what are we trying to do here? It is concerned with describing and evaluating a relationship between, well, one variable on one side, so the left-hand side will be your Y variable, your dependent variable, the, well, dependent variable. You can also call, of course, Y. Let's just call it like that. And you're gonna try to explain it or evaluate or describe it, whatever you wanna call it, given one or more variables on the other side. I put up a few examples here. And the first one is, of course, the typical cap N. How does the return on one asset vary with the level of market risk? So, of course, we are trying to look at the, for instance, excess return of a given stock or an asset, how it relates to the excess return of the market. Classical cap M, but, of course, can also just be evaluated by a regression analysis. And uh, another thing that could be, what factors impact the price or demand for a good? This is a perfect time to come up with some examples why this could be very, very great. I have my own research project I'm writing uh, as we speak about Swedish fine art paintings and how you actually price those. So what are we doing? We're trying to relate the hammer price on one side and relate that to different characteristics of the painter, painting, and where the painting was sold and so forth. Try to simply explain the price via observable factors. So this is just one of many examples what this could be useful for. And it doesn't have to be that complicated. It just have to, well, would just say, tell a good story, but also, of course, be interesting. I certainly think it's interesting, and I learned a lot already. But uh, hopefully you can see that be published one day if it turns out to be a success. But this is, again, just an example of what you could use it for. So before we go any further, there's one thing I need to clear up. Because um, this one, I both get annoyed with from students and also when I read on the news. And uh, what does it tell us? It tells us that people don't know what's going on. Or rather, they don't know what the difference between correlation and causation is. So let's first look at correlation. When you're talking about correlation, you're talking about the linear association between two variables. That is, they're treated symmetrically. That means if you change one variable, that doesn't cause changes in the other. There just happen to be linear related, linearly related with one another. Let me give you a fantastic example of something like that. Look at here, we have the US spending on science and technology, or oh, and space, ooh. But it also tells us it's highly correlated with the amount of people who's, 
who commit suicide by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation. That's fantastic to talk about in your lecture, but uh, I guess there's just a lot of... Um, it could be flat earthers uh, learning that uh, the whole life was a lie, I don't know. But uh, this is correlation, and I repeat, correlation, not causation, guys. So one does not cause the other, this just happens to be highly correlated. And uh, fantastic stuff on that website, I would say. But I'm going to come back to that in a later lecture, just to give an example. Now, we also have regression analysis, and this is different, because now you have a dependent variable, so that's one of them, is treated differently from the independent variable x. So y and x are not treated the same. You're assuming here that y is stochastic, fancy word for random actually, so you treat your, it has a probability distribution around it, and x is assumed to be fixed, non-random or, well, non-stochastic for fancy wording. This makes a very big difference between correlation and causation. So here you can talk about y being caused by x, given the setup, and not like your setup in correlation. Again, it's actually nicely explained in the book if you want it a little further. It's also where I got some of the notes from. So, well, go and check it out. It's on the reading list for today's lecture, if you haven't read it already, of course. But you're good students, of course, so you already read all the material and prepared for the lecture. You can see I totally have high expectation of everyone, of course. But you're going to be doing just fine, I am certain. Now, let's start with a nice example of a simple linear regression. Simplest of all, we take just, yeah, dependent variable on one independent variable. Suppose we want to study the relationship between the super well-named fund XXX and the excess return of the market index. Let's put it up like this here. You got on one hand, we got the excess return of this uh, totally not suspicious fund. I keep saying I should change it, but nah, I'm too lazy for that. And then I'll leave it up to you what you're going to call it, what you think it is. And the extra turn of the market portfolio on the one ha other hand. You can look at the numbers here, and you already get an idea that just by, you know, eyeballing it, you see that if one goes up, the other one goes up. So it suggests a positive relationship. The best way just to get around this is perhaps just let's do, do a scatter plot. You're right, Slowpoke. Thanks. Thanks for that, Slowpoke. You got it. So if we put up here a scatter plot, we see that we dot these five dots against each other. And again, it indeed suggests a nice linear relationship. And uh, well, we can of course just try and draw a straight line. And that's actually what we're doing, especially with OLS. We're just drawing straight lines. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you know how to draw a straight line, we're well on the way to pass this course. That's a good start at least. Ah, too much said if you can pass with that. Let's just not. So uh, we can approximate this relationship using the equation for a straight line. And that is, we relate y, your dependent variable, to a constant alpha, plus beta x, beta being the slope of this line. <coughs> there we go. And of course, we assume that this relationship is not perfect, as you can already see. Let's see if I can get my coarser on here. You can see my coarser now, I hope. Tell me if you can't, or tell me if you can. That would be nice to hear from you guys. You can see the relationship is not perfect. You see the line cannot straight go through all single, or all points in this case, right? We are drawing a straight line. We are restricting ourselves to that. And of course, since it's not perfect, we have to add a so-called error term to this. And of course, for reasons explained later, we assume that the average value, so the expected value of this error term is zero. But well, we're gonna come back to that, of course. And we, of course, we have some subscripts T, which just takes on the value one, two, three, four, up until capital T. In this case here, it's five, because we've got five observations. You can call it five time periods. So this is just what we're trying to do. But um, let's just uh, build on this first and hopefully explain all the components that comes with it. And we can immediately extend this to multiple regression or not simple linear regression anymore, but it is rather simple when we think about it. The only thing we're doing now here is, instead of just regressing y on one x, we're adding multiple independent variables. As you can see here on the nice little picture in the middle here, we now have one intercept, of course, we stick to that, and we have multiple slopes, multiple independent variables. Let's build on this a little bit. We have our dependent variable on one side, or left-hand side, whatever you want to call it, but we're just going to call it dependent variable here. We have our intercept here, 
And of course, we have all the independent variables x2 up until xk in this case. We have that, of course, the constant term has a nice little x1 attached to it. But since it's one for all of them, it's basically invisible. So we don't have to really write it down. It simply looks simpler without it, right? And of course, we have all the beta terms, which are just the estimated slopes of each of these characteristica that we are trying to relate to the dependent variable. So you can see here that all these are slopes, like I said, where each of these coefficients, beta j's, or should they be beta k's, I think, I think I have to change it to a k. Yeah, I'll correct that later. The measure the impact on the y. So you're trying to take each of these individual components and see how they relate to your dependent variable. And last but not least, we got this nice little error term. And yeah, Slowpoke, I already told you, we're including this because, well, we're assuming the relationship is not perfect. But you may be onto something because um, there's more reasons why we do so. But before we get there, let's take a step back, or in this case, just lean back a little bit and take a note about data types. In general, we have three types of data. We got, first of all, we got our cross-sectional data. Imagine that is multiple observations at one point in time. That is, if I'm standing in a classroom and I ask you all to fill out a survey at this moment in time. That is a cross-section. One point in time on multiple entities. The second thing is the time series. Here I look at one entity over multiple periods of time. Take the classroom again. I ask one student to fill out the survey each of the seven weeks. And there I got a time series on that one student for seven weeks. And of course, we can combine those two and get panel data. It's also known as longitudinal data, but we're just going to call it panel data for the purpose of this course. Besides, it's also easier to pronounce. And uh, what we're doing here, you are simply combining cross-section and time series together. You have multiple entities at multiple points in time. Back to my little classroom example here. It simply becomes, I'm surveying all of you in a classroom every single week. In this way, I got multiple observations at multiple points in time. I've also noted here the different subscripts that are current that are typically used. And you can, of course, easily relate this to. So you see up here, you got I for the cross section from one until N. You got for time series, for so lowercase t from one up to uppercase t. And of course, you got it. You can, of course, see that here, how they are related and written on each of the variables. See for the panel case here in the bottom, y subscript it, and here beta x it, epsilon, the error term, it, for instance. That should hopefully go over the different data types. Coffee fair. That's good for you, I guess. Well, the random error component here captures a number of different things. And that's what we're going to talk about now, because actually that's the source of all our trouble, but also where we have to make all our assumptions later. And first of all, we always leave out some determinants. You have to think about it. Regardless of how many X variables, independent variables I will add to my model, theoretically, I'm always forgetting something whether it's relevant or not. But of course, let's just leave it at relevant things. So I'm always leaving something out. And the second thing is, there may also be things that cannot be modeled. Suppose I'm figuring out the stock price again on this given stock that I want to measure to see what's the return on the stock. There's some things I cannot model. And that could be anything that are, you know, behavioral characteristics of the people in the board of this firm. I don't know, I can't model that, or people's motivation, or simply people's entrepreneurial spirit, or investment strategy, or their nose for good business. These kind of things I can't model, so I can't add all those measurements. So there's some things we just cannot add. And third, but definitely not least, there's also random things we can't do. And that could be terrorist attacks, national attacks, and double rainbows all over the place. It, um, yeah. There are some things we just cannot. There are random outside influences that randomly impacts our stocks or our dependent variable in this case here. So that's definitely another thing. So that's why mainly we're including this error term. And um, 
let's uh, go and determine these regression coefficients. I talked about this uh, intercept alpha and a number of different betas. And the thing is, how do we even determine these? You all heard this before, hopefully, before this course in your undergraduate study or bachelor's degree, right? You heard about OLS, which is just ordinarily squares the technique we're going to be using throughout this course. And uh, how do we get the line here? That is by using OLS. But to understand why and how, first you have to know that alpha and beta are unknown and have to be estimated. These are parameters that we need to estimate. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. And we're going to use the dates that we have at hand to be able to accomplish this. That's the plan. So in order to get there, of course, the most common way to estimate these unknown parameters is by using OLS, ordinary least squares, to determine these two things. And what it actually does, it tries to minimize the sum of squared residuals. Now, that for a lot of people who don't really know what that is, that sounds very confusing. What is the sum of squared residuals? What's a residual? What's, well, we know what a square is, but there's a lot of things that could be a little chaotic and a little uh, confusing. Well, let's uh, try to disentangle that a little bit. So let's look at what are the different components. First of all, let's denote yt. So here we go to notation, guys. yt denotes the actual point in our data set for a given observation. So that's the data that we can see, we can observe, that's what we have. Then we have on the second line here, let's use my cursor here again, that will help a little bit. We have yt hat, where hat denotes the estimate, or rather the fitted value from the regression line. So yt is the actual value, yt hat is the estimated or fitted value. We subtract those two and you're left with an error or what we call a residual that we call ut hat. That is the residual. And now remember, the sum of squared residuals. So we know what a residual is now. Squared residual, I can figure that one out. That's squaring this ut, okay? And then the sum of all these squares. So you take all these residuals from each of the observations, you square them and you sum them and you want to minimize that. That's what we're trying to minimize. Because the smaller that one is, the smaller this sum is, the better it fits this line. The smaller are the errors or the distances from the line to the actual points. Now, let's put this aside a little bit and look at it here. This is how we would picture it. So, the smaller this distance here is, the smaller the squared residual is. But you can also think, why are we squaring these? Well, that's because if we would minimize the absolute value, or minimize just the values, negatives would cancel out positives. So if we get something on the lower side of the line, then we'll cancel out any things on the upper side of the line. So that doesn't make any sense. That's why we are squaring them all. Because of course we learned, and this is where one of the prerequisites sequently comes in, minus time minus is equal to plus. And uh, yeah, that may seem awfully simple, but uh, trust me, I've seen students forget that, even on their masters, which is uh, quite funny at times. And it doesn't mean I don't forget it, but... Mm. Oh, I should um, remember to drink my coffee a little faster because it gets a little cold and it becomes a little nasty at the end. So the good thing is I got more coffee, so we can always get some more. But okay, what are we going to do here? So now we got this little fine line here. Great. But what are we actually minimizing? Slowpoke. I already told you guys that, so we know this. We're minimizing the sum of squared residuals. And how we're going to do that? We do it the following way. We choose alpha and beta such that it's minimized. Okay, great. But let's put it up in formulas. You're trying to optimize the following. You have this Lagrange function that we all learn, learn in our mathematics course, so we're not going to deal with it here. And of course, we take the derivative and set equal to zero and minimize. That's what we do. So that's what we're going to do here. So you take the derivative equal to zero. So we do it with respect to alpha. So you take delta L, delta alpha. So we're trying to optimize, or in this case here, find a solution for alpha. In this case here, also for beta. 
good for you guys. You don't have to calculate this. This has all been derived multiple times. You've probably seen it before. So we're just going to apply some magic and come up with the formulas here for you, which are, if I'm not mistaken, displayed on the screen right here. So hopefully you can see them. Right? Yeah, good. So, so there you can actually see what the formulas are. So that's pretty good. Now, back to this example we had before with the five dots. Now, if I use these formulas for these five dots, I get the following. We get this nice little line here. We get alpha to be minus 1.74 and beta had to be 1.64. Now, um, that means we get to fit a line of the following. We have y t hat equal to the intercept plus the slope times x. Stata reports it this way, and this is a nicer way to report it. How are we going to make Stata report it nicely? That's something we're going to be dealing with in the computer practicals, and something that will haunt you forever if you do it poorly in your master thesis. But of course, what do we get here? We get a positive coefficient, which means that if the excess return of the market goes up by 1, we see that the excess return of our stock, here in this case here, the excess return of, was it Ford again, I believe? more if I remember correctly, goes up by 1.642 Cetris Paribus. Do not forget that. Everything else held constant. In this case here, we don't really have to do it because there's only one, uh, one uh, independent variable. If there's multiple, we kind of have to remember it. We see there's three stars. That means it's significant at the 1% level. We have it also nicely displayed in the bottom of a table. P-values here for 10%, 5%, 1%. We're going to come back to that at the end of today's lecture, so don't get confused by that now. But there's one big issue with this one here. Guys, this is where you're going to wake up in the chat. And I'm going to request something for you guys. What's the problem with this whole regression? This is the time where I can lean back for a few seconds and wait for your answer. What's the problem with this regression? Yeah. And pour some more coffee, of course. What is the problem? What is wrong? Oh no. Correlated. That's the first one. That's from Bart. So Bart, you say it's correlated. Well, it's good it's correlated. Not perfectly, but it's good it's correlated. So it's unfortunate not that. Anything else you guys can come up with? It's not unrelated, but correlated is not unfortunate not to correct this here. We got one from you from Chile uh, and Frank, constant non-zero. Constant non-zero is not a problem, but the number of observations is we simply have low N. As Anthony says here, so very good guys. We got here indeed that we have way too few observations for this one to be trustworthy whatsoever. You should not run regression analysis with this few observations. It is just a stupid classroom example, so we'll hopefully fix that in just a moment. I would like to make a note about this... Uh, constant. We're going to come back to that, but I would like to make a note already. You see here that it's insignificant, that this has no stars. That means in a statistical sense it is not statistically different from zero. So uh, that we have that the constant is non-zero, it's statistically still zero, because it's not different from zero, statistically speaking, right? So that's not a problem. But we're going to come back to that. But again, the problem here is the number of observations. So um, with that settled, let's improve on this a little bit. <laughs> you know, go grab some. There's uh, plenty of coffee out there, guys. So um, let's uh, dive in some little more here. Let's use a better example. Let's improve on this situation. So now I got some Ford data here. Ah, that was what it was before. So I have my fund XXX, but now I'll go to Ford instead. So we used the excess turn from Ford. You know those dudes that make cars, right? Over in the States? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. And we have the market index S&P 500, which is one of the most popular indices around there. So we got a lot of data from November 1989 to August 2010. Now, let's see what we get. We estimate a simple linear regression following the model that's displayed on screen here. Right. So we see here we have the excess return that's your Y, that's ER4, and we have a beta on the ERSNP. Okay. We estimate that, and we get the following here. Now, what do we get? We get the beta, because, of course, we call it the beta because it's just the cap M, right? So we know what the term is here, the financial beta. We estimate that it's 1.315, 
it has three stars that is significant at the one percent level now we don't have the problem with observations this time because now we've got 249 that is a lot better but what do how do we interpret this so first of all it's statistically significant at the one percent level we got that one covered what does it furthermore say if the market excess market return goes up by one the stock excess return for ford or sorry the ford excess return will go up by 1.315 that is beta is above one so in a more financial sense it moves in the same direction as the market but it's more volatile because the coefficient is above one that's what we see here and here we see that the coefficient for the constant is significant statistically different from zero but let's not dwell with that because that talks about the alpha and of course what the financial alpha is well, you guys know how to Google and go on Vistopedia, so go in there and check it out. It's not something we are going to concern us with right now. So that should stop for now, at least for this year. Let's take a f one more thing, maybe. Let me see. No, I think this is a perfect time to go take a small break. I will have just a 10-minute break for you guys. I'll be back at, uh, well, in 10 minutes from now. And, uh, yeah, go get some coffee. That's a perfect time. And, uh, well... Roll pause credits and uh, see you back in 10 minutes, guys. Bye-bye. Hello and welcome back to, well, the second part of today's lecture. And uh, first, now I'm ready. Okay, let's go on with part two of today's lecture. So we went all the way through the basis of OLS, what it actually means and what it tries to do. Now let's dive into some of the assumptions underlying or First, let's just uh, discuss linearity. In order to use OLS, we require that the model is linear. And what does that mean? That means that it must be linear in the parameters, so linear in alpha and beta, but it doesn't have to be linear in X and Y. To understand that a little better, let's put up some examples. First of all, this one here, you can estimate. It's linear in the parameters, so you see here the beta here, that is linear. Oh, let's put up the courses so you can see it. The beta is linear. However, this is not linear because you squared x, but that's fine. On the other hand, if I would do this here, so I would say x to the power of beta, uh -uh, that wouldn't go. That would not be linear in the parameter. So that's so the bottom one, nope. The first one is a yes. So that's what we mean by linearity. So you can use square term, cube terms, or whatnot. That's fine. As long as it's not on the beta. So that covered, let's dive into the actual OLS assumptions. Coffee time, thank you very much. Ah, so is it a good estimator? Well, that depends on if you're willing to make the assumptions. And uh, yeah, I watch a lot of Lord of the Rings, no surprise there. But okay, what are the assumptions we use according to Brooks at least? It follows the following four assumptions. So the first one I already signaled a bit earlier. That is the expected value, so the average value of the error term is zero. So interpretation, zero mean, that's what it is. And the second one is, is the one we called homoscedasticity. In other words, it means that the errors have a constant and finite variance. What do I mean by finite? That means it actually exists. So to update Brooks a little bit to be more correct, I think this should say less than infinity. Because yes, you could have something where the variance is infinite. Try to calculate the variance of a Cauchy sequence, uh, for instance. That would be difficult. But that's an example of that. So we call this homoscedasticity. If it's not fulfilled, it's called heteroscedasticity. The third one is the errors are uncorrelated between observations. That is what we call no serial correlation, or rather no autocorrelation. That's the third one. And finally, the tough one, number four, is that there's no covariance between the error terms and the right hand side right hand side variables in other words we have that they're independent and uncorrelated meaning no endogeneity that is they're exogenous those are the assumptions that we have to make and first one never a problem if you include a constant simple as that so you don't even have to think more about that one for now at least for two and three they happen a lot in finance, so they could be alarming. However, they have very quick fixes, both two and three. So we can account for them, or at least take them into account when estimating. 
So I would, we are going to discuss them a lot, of course, because you have to be able to do this correctly. But in practice, you can fix it. They're fixable, and it's okay. But finally, the last one can be an issue. And that one has a lot of different flavors, and we're going to discuss that a lot more in detail in the second lecture. So we're going to come back to that one there. But to highlight a little bit, you may have to change the estimation method, for instance. So that's one thing I would like you to note. But these are the four assumptions we're going to be dealing with in this course. If you have these four assumptions fulfilled, you get a number of properties. Fantastic, right? That is, OLS is said to be the best linear unbiased estimator. That is, we just call it blue. You know, that blue stuff, right? So it is blue. If it's not fulfilled, it's no longer blue. And what does blue stand for? It stands for, in this case, best. What does that mean? Lowest variance of all linear unbiased estimators. So I'm going to discuss that a little bit in a moment, but it means it's simply the best. Lowest variance. It's linear. We covered that a couple of slides ago. Unbiased means it's on average equal to its true value. So on average, they hit correct. So a little over, a little under, but on average, they're correct. That's what matters. And finally, it's an estimator. And that's, of course, that these alpha and beta hat are estimators of the true values alpha and beta. All these things we already discussed a little earlier. So that should hopefully recap very quickly what is meant by blue. And of course, let's discuss these properties in a little more detail, shall we? Starting with unbiasedness. So you got the four thing, the three properties here. The first one simply meaning on average that they're true. It simply means, put in another way, that if you take the expected value of the intercept, the estimate of alpha, given all your independent variables, we call this here uppercase X, standing for just this matrix of all these different independent variables, they're equal to the true value. And similar for all the slope parameters. So all the beta hats, given these Xs, this information data matrix, or whatever you want to call it, Given those, it is equal to its true value. On average, they're correct. That's what it simply means in layman's terms. We also have consistency, which is um, not as strong as unbiasedness. Unbiasedness is a stronger condition, I would like to say, because unbiasedness holds both for small and large samples. For consistency, that is only for large samples. And it means it has, well, to put up a little mathematics for you here, this simply just means the limit, so the probability limit, as the number of observations grow towards infinity, then this distance between the actual parameter and the estimate becomes arbitrarily small. So what it simply says, it converges when it becomes very, very large. So simply it talks about, ah, we're going to the right value if we just get more observations. The more the merrier, the closer we get. And that's exactly what it says. So as I already said, unbiased is clearly stronger because it works in small samples as, as well as large samples, where consistency is only a thing for large samples. So that's something you would have to know, and it's very important. And more importantly, they're just not the same. Absolutely not the same. So just because something has biasness doesn't imply consistency. And just because something is consistent doesn't imply unbiasedness. You you will have the job to go and figure out an example of something where one does not imply the other and one way or another. And it goes both ways. There's no arrow both ways here. That's not how this works. So that's the most important thing. Sip of coffee. Now we have efficiency. And when I mean efficient in terms of this course here, it doesn't mean that I wrote something in the bit, the fast and quickest way or whatnot. No, it means that it has the lowest variance. So of all these unbiased estimators that may be out there, this one here from OLS produces the lowest variance. This we say here. So if beta or this B, just regular B, is just any other different estimator, it means that it can never be better. It, can, it could be the same or larger, but it can never be smaller than this from OLS, which the beta hat. That's simply what it means. Lowest probability that it lies away from its true value. And of course, it could be a thing. 
the question that becomes, would there ever be a case where you would like to say trade in some of these on unbiasedness for variance reduction? What do I mean by that? I mean, you could get an estimator with a lower variance if you're willing to sacrifice a little bias, if you're willing to accept some bias. Because remember, OLS is the best one when it's unbiased. What if I said we could just, in some cases, say, wow, we give away a little of an un uh, we give away a little bias, but we know we're way more precise, in the sense that the standard errors, or in this case, the variance here, becomes much smaller. Is that the case? Do we even have that? It exists. And the thing is, yes, there's a trade-off and actually is often discussed. And an example is whether RCT or not. That's a really good example of this. First of all, what's an RCT? That's a randomized control trial. Think about it as a lab experiment, but it also happens outside the lab. So what it simply means, you have randomly assigned a treatment and control group, truly, truly random. However, in some cases in practice, that's not possible. So if we would run an RCT, we get the most unbiased, the most you know clean estimator out there. However, it could be, in some cases, you'll be better off saying, you know what, I cannot run an RCT. I can do the second best thing in terms of unbiasedness. However, I am able to, by doing so, get a smaller variance. So you get something for something, right? One thing for another. And one thing you can think about it here, let's put that one away. One thing you can think about here, look at these dartboards. Don't know how much dart you watch or how much you like to scream 180, but uh, if you look at the upper left one here, somebody hit a lot of uh, ball size. That's not even 180, that only produces 150 if you hit that three times, so it's not even the best one to go for. But the point here, the best estimator you want is the upper left corner. That's where you both have the low bias and low variance. And what does it mean when you're moving from one dartboard to another? Now, let's think about it. First of all, you have the best estimator up here. The worst one is the lower right corner. Here you have something that both has high bias, means you're far away from the middle, and high variance, that is the spread is larger. What I mean by suppose you have the most unbiased estimator, but there's some variance, then you're in the lower left. That is, on average, you're correct, you're right in the middle, but your variance is a little high, so you're a little around, all around the place, but on average, it's correct. But what if there's some cases where you say, you know what, I'm not going to do an RCT, but I'm but I'm going to get something that is a little more biased on average, so it's consistently a little off, but it's way more precise. That corresponds that we move from the lower left to the upper right, for instance. So that means up here in the upper right, we now have a case where we're consistently a little off, but we know we have, that that we know, but we also know this estimate here is now way more precise. So that depends on what, what you want, right? Or what you're able to do so. But it's your job here to know what happens when we go from one board to another. So don't forget to study that. That's a good point. Because it's really good to understand how this actually works, how moving around these dark boards here work. So don't forget to study that. And uh, this is also a very important thing about the way I lecture. When I say something that's important to study, that means you're gonna see it. So don't forget it. Now, when we want to make inference, let's talk about standard errors and precision. So we already talked about the precision here, right, in terms of variance. And without that, we cannot talk We cannot talk about standard errors and all these here when we mention this. Let me rewind a little bit. We cannot talk about precisions without talking about standard errors. That was what I meant to say. So the thing is here, we want to make some inference. That is, we want to, you know, make hypothesis testing. And of course, what is this? This is the point estimate. That's the estimate we obtained, the 1.315. And the question becomes, how reliable is it? This is where, in order to say how reliable it is, what do we need? Coffee. Now, what do we need? We need the standard error. So the reliability of a point estimate is measured by the standard error that you see right below here in this output. So you see here for this one here, the standard error is 0 
We know from our first statistics course that if I divide these two with each other, you get the T statistic. And of course, based on the T statistic, you can already draw conclusions very quickly if it rejects or do not reject your null hypothesis of this coefficient being equal to zero. We're going to discuss this a lot more as we go along with the course, but it's something I assume is known. So um, this is what we can talk about here. But some notes about the standard here. So, of course, you can calculate these standards using the following formulas. And um, let me save you here. I'm not going to ask you to produce these. We have started to do it for you. You just need to know where they come from. You need to know the practical implications of this. Because remember, we're very practical. We're very um, hands-on in this course. Of course, we need to know where things come from, but we need to apply this in practice. And uh, in order to do so, there's two things you need to remember. First of all, some remarks here. First, the larger the sample size, the smaller the standard error. I would like just to call this the more the merrier, right? So the more observations you have, the more precise you get because the more information you have. This one is pretty straightforward to understand. There's not so much about it. So what it boils down to, you just want more observations. Okay, job done. Let's put that one aside. Now let's go to the second remark. The larger the spread, so the more variation you have in your data, the smaller standard errors. And yeah, I get slowpoke's confusion here. I really do. Because this one can be hard to understand. Let's think about it. Let's go back to the formulas. Look at the formulas here for beta. Let's look at that one. This is the spread. Mathematics says me, tells me it's on the bottom here. Don't, re don't remember if stuff is called denominator or denominator. I always forget that. But let's just talk about the one that's on the bottom. The larger that one becomes, the smaller this whole value becomes, of course. So, of course, this one directly says in a mathematical sense, the larger this variation, the smaller the standard error. So, you can look at it here pure mathematically. But let's just put a visual on it. Let's look at the, these two dots here. If I have the black dots and the blue dots, they both have, ex they produce exactly the same line. But the question is which one would I prefer in terms of my standard errors? Which one of the two would produce the smaller set of standard errors? I like to ask this in class when we're like in person and everything, but when we're online, of course, it loses a little of its value. But the point being here, like I said, the more variation is better. So we would always prefer the black dots in this case over the blue dots because there's a larger spread. They will come with the same estimate of the same line, but the variance or the standard error in this case, sorry, will be smaller because the spread is larger. Pure mathematics in this case. So those are two very important remarks. Larger n is great, or larger t. Larger t, more the merrier, and the larger spread. Okie dokie. Perfect time to a little more coffee. Okie dokie. Let's carry on a little bit. Let's uh, use a better example. Up until now, I used a simple linear regression as an example. Let's build a little on that. So that means in another way, let's add another couple of factors. I hope that you guys have been introduced to the farmer, sorry, farmer French free factor model. Otherwise, I guarantee you're going to see it in portfolio theory or perhaps even in institutional investment management. I hopefully you heard about it before. But what it is, Compared to the old CAPM, we add two additional variables, SMB and HML. They stand for small minus big and high minus low. Small minus big relates to this uh, small firm effect. And high minus low is about this uh, value effect. You know, value stocks outperform growth stocks, something like that. All this fear here again, you can read in the book or even if SDP, there are Google, all there are your friends, right? So you can read it there. But you can find the factors actually directly online. They're on uh, Kenneth French's webpage. So I put a link here. If you download the slides, the PDF versions, you can just click the here, Slowpoke says. Thanks, Slowpoke. That's a good one. So what it actually helps you here, if you ever need it, they're readily available there. That's also one thing I really would like to emphasize. I'll try my best to come with some examples, also point you into a data source, because I know that you're going to spend a lot of time looking for data, trying to find it, and be confused. And uh, when you write your master thesis, that can take a lot of time. And you don't want to spend a lot of time finding your data. 
oh, you want to be sure you spent your time writing a masterpiece, mm -hmm, right? So let's estimate this fantastic farmer French free factor model. Now, it's pretty simple. What do we expect? Do we expect this beta to be larger or smaller than one? In other words, we remember we had it to be larger than one before, but now when we include these two additional factors, do we expect it to be more volatile than the market, be around the same as the market, that is around one, or less volatile than the market, so smaller than one? Hmm. Any guesses from the from the audience? This uh, beta here. So we talk about just the expected beta one here, right? Let me put it here. The expected beta one. Do we expect this to be around uh, e, around one, larger than one, smaller than one? Any guesses on that? Hmm. See if the audience is awake. That would be great. Smaller. That's one. Anybody else that wants to chime in on what Frank says here? You know, we think it's smaller? Let's see if we get something that is smaller than one here. That would be uh, interesting. Okie dokie. Let's go on and see what we get. We get something that's actually, well, larger than one. Well, larger than one in what we observe. So I'm not saying that Frank is wrong yet because we're not there yet look here we see a 1.218 three stars yes that means it's statistically significant but wait a minute the hypothesis that's always tested here behind any any year any regression table you see here is whether it's statistically different from zero so this year doesn't tell us it's different from one no it tells us it's different from zero so in order to test the hypothesis equal to one, we have to make a separate hypothesis test. One which we're going to do a little later. So it could be it is not statistically bigger than one. And then Frank would be right. But it looks like here that it's going to be larger than one. But we're not quite there. So again, we see something smaller. We see that SMB, there's no small firm effect here. It's not statistically different from zero. But we do see high minus low going in with a negative value here talking about these value stocks versus growth stocks and we actually see a negative sign here the financial interpretation i will leave to you because you're going to need it later wink wink assignment stuff you have to do mm -hmm. but what you can see here stats are easily just built a nice little table for us to work with here and adding this in stats is really simple and also the whole idea of just adding a few more regressors or independent variables straightforward now the final thing I want to discuss here for today is just hypothesis testing. I know I've included some of it over in the, in the supplementary material. That's where I go way more in depth than here. But let's just briefly go over it here. I think that'll be nice. So before we do this, we need an additional assumption. We actually need a fifth assumption. And that is that the errors are normally distributed. Let me make this very clear, guys. You don't need the fifth assumption here in order to have the best linear unbiased estimators, the blue estimators. They're unbiased without the fifth assumption, but you need the fifth assumption in order for this here to be, well, in order for us to conduct inference, that is hypothesis testing. And uh, I'm going to give you an example of a t-test and an f-test. What's the difference? Well, that depends on whether you're testing one or multiple restrictions. And uh, the thing about this one here, it's rarely a problem in practice. Guys, this is, and I swear, ah, can't swear, I can't, can't, can't promise anything I can't keep, but question to you guys, why is this not a problem in practice? Anybody who actually knows this? Do you know why the fifth assumption is rarely, and I, it doesn't say it's never, but it's rarely a problem in practice? Anybody who knows why? Because this is a very important point, I think. Central limit theorem. Yeah. I'll buy it. That's very good, Frank. Indeed. What does that mean? That means, well, it's asymptotically normal, said in a different way. That means that sample is large enough, it will converge towards a normal distribution. If I'm not forget if I'm mistaken, that's what our central limit theorem tells us. Correct me if I'm wrong. But that should be what we really need here. 
So that's why it's rarely a problem in practice, especially for financial data, because we have very large data sets typically. Of course, you cannot really use this if your data sample is small. But if we have large data set, no problem whatsoever, guys. No problem. Then you can just use it. And that's it. So that's why. Let's go over to hypothesis testing now. And this is where we come back to this uh, other test. Remember, the standard test is whether it's equal to zero, but we can also just conduct a separate test to see whether this beta, beta one here, is statistically different from one. So let's try that. We have the formula, which is the estimate, that's 1.218, minus a hypothesized value. So that's in this case one, but normally it will be zero if it's just in the regression table. That's why I say you can just take the coefficient divided by the standard error and you get your t-value. In this case here, because our hypothesized value is one, you would first have to subtract one before dividing with the standard error. Doing so, we get 1.147. Now, you hopefully remember from your statistics lessons that a 5% value is the 1.96 cutoff in a large sample. So we already know because our t-value is lower than that, it's not significantly different from one at the 5% level. Maybe at a 10, but then again, 10 is around 1.6, I think, or so 1.55 or so 1.6 something. I have to look down my book, but definitely 1.147 is too low. We also get that confirmed here because this is the starter command that we use. Let's put the course up here. And we see when I do this, I get a p-value of 0, 2, 5, 1, 4. That is a p-value that is larger than 10%. Ergo, we do not reject our new hypothesis at any relevant significance level, 1, 5, or 10%. I would like to give a note here, because I said this was a t-test, and it is, but Stata uses the F-test for this. And no need to worry, because remember, the T-statistic is just the square root of the F, and when you have an F-test with only one restriction, it just boils down to a T-test. That's why Stata just used an F-test, but it amounts to the same thing. So for you, and the easy p-value regulation rule here, or whatever the p-value rule, just use that one, because that remains the same whether it's F or T-test in this case. So that's why it's no problem at all here. That's why we can just look at the p-value and directly conclude. And of course, if we reject it, like I said, we say it's statistically significant. It's very important we get the wording correct here. Statistically significant. Okay? And another thing here I would very much like to point. Don't get blinded by the stars. What does that mean? If you would estimate something, and it turns out to be significant, statistically speaking, right, at 1% level. So it's strongly statistically significant, but the coefficient is teeny, teeny, teeny. Then we talk about that it's maybe not economically significant. So in this case here, just because something is statistically significant doesn't mean it has any economical consequences. Sure, it often has, but I just want you to make aware of this. Could be that it's so small it doesn't matter. Could be. Okay, that's your round off the t-test for now. Then we have the f-test, and here comes one of my uh, laziness, but uh, what is me lecturing without be me being lazy? Well, besides drinking a lot of coffee. So I wrote Microsoft, figure out later, open the best software on Windows that is paint, and uh, wrote Ford over it. So if you want to test two restrictions or more, we use an f-test. And in this case here, I see that Individually speaking, SMB is individually insignificant. HML is significant individually speaking. But what if I want to test them both at the same time? That is, I want to test if they are jointly significant. Because you would say, ah, SMB is insignificant. I should drop it from my model. But two things. First, there can be a nice theoretical argument why you should display it. In this case, there is. The whole found a French series of paper explaining this back in the 80s, 90s. I think it's 1993. Second, it could be jointly significant as it turns out to be here. So now what do you see here? We see over here, on our little table here, using the Stata test command over here, you see, oh, the p-value here, or in this case here, is 0 0.0773. 
it is lower than 0.1, which is significant at the 10% level. So in terms of stars, it will get one star. Woo. So it will be significant at 10% level. Ergo, they are jointly significant. So that shows the difference here, why we should not drop it. And uh, let me highlight it one more time. Be sure to study the supplementary material because I will go over this in a little more detail. And of course, also R squared. I didn't mention R squared almost at all here. I actually didn't mention it before now. And well, I don't really like it, but it doesn't mean it's not without its uses. And I discussed it over in the supplementary material, which you guys can go and take a look at. And the sooner the better, of course, because, well, it may come back before you know it. And uh, with that said, that was all for today's lecture. You can see I'm actually done a little earlier. Isn't that fantastic? So this is where I would like to round off and say, well, good luck with the course. Thank you very much for watching. And um, yeah, that ends today's lecture. <laughs>